Thanks, Marie. <laughs> Just give me a minute. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> A different kind of superhero. It was a hot, muggy morning, and Christopher was not sure he really wanted to be out riding in a competition. His thoroughbred horse, Eastern Express, seemed a bit off, as if maybe he would be much happier grazing in a field than doing the demanding work of running and jumping with a large, muscular man on his back. Maybe, Christopher thought, it would be nicer to take the kids sailing today where there would be a cool breeze. Well, he thought, I'm a lucky man to be able to choose between riding and sailing. In fact, in fact, plenty of people watching Christopher that day thought the same thing. He was many people's idea of a superhero. He was the actor who played Superman in the movies and in real life he fit the part. He was handsome, he was strong, he was always striving towards a goal or learning a new skill. And then, in an instant, everything changed. Eastern Express balked at a jump, sending Christopher crashing to the ground. When he woke up in the hospital, he couldn't move his hands or his feet. He couldn't even breathe without the help of a machine. Although doctors could repair his neck, they could not fix the injury to his spinal cord. Now Christopher's brain was unable to communicate with most of his body, and even though he still had strength and intelligence and willpower, there was no way for him to move any part of his body below his head. Despair washed over him. If he could not do anything, if he could not be useful to anyone, what was the point? Maybe, he said to his wife Dana, we should just let me go. And Dana spoke words that helped to start him on the road toward his new life. But you're still you, and I love you. Now, of course, Christopher Reeve had never actually been able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, but he had been a tremendous athlete. He always liked a goal. He always liked a challenge, something to work for. And before his accident, his challenges involved acting and directing and sports. Now his challenges were different. Now it took all his strength and determination to sit up in a wheelchair and to steer it by puffing on a straw. His heart ached with all that he had lost. He might never again be able to hug his wife and sons or ride a horse, but he realized he still had a lot, the love of his family, and he had a lot of money. So he decided to use everything he still had to work toward a goal. As always, Christopher Reeve dreamed big. He hoped there might be a cure for spinal cord injuries, not just for himself, but also for thousands of others whose lives had been changed. He and his wife set up a foundation. They asked people for money to help pay scientists to research a cure. Dana realized, of course, that they had, um, they had a ramp into their home and a big van that could fit Christopher's wheelchair, and not everybody had that, so they collected money to help pay for ramps and other helpful things, other accommodations, so that other people with spinal cord injuries could have them. This isn't in the story, but that's ha what happens when you don't have health care for everyone. So um, Christopher realized that even though he could no longer use his arms and legs, he had a power that many do not. He was famous. He was Superman. So now he could really be a hero, not by flying through the air to rescue people, but by speaking up. Because he was famous, people might pay attention. They would listen, and they might want to help. It wasn't easy. He didn't want people to feel sorry for him. Nobody likes to be pitied. And he didn't want to feel embarrassed if he couldn't use his mouth to speak well or his body jerked around without his control. But he knew that he had a power. And he knew that he had a chance to use that power to make the world a better place. So he started speaking. 
He called Congress to support stem cell research uh, that might lead to a cure for spinal cord injuries. He asked groups of people to get involved and donate money. He talked with others. He spoke on television, showing that though his abilities had changed, his heart and his soul were strong and capable. A writer for Reader's Digest magazine interviewed Christopher Reeve during the, uh, during, at the very end of his life, like in 2004. And they asked him why he had joined the Unitarian Church. And he answered, it gives me a moral compass. I often refer to Abe Lincoln, who said, when I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. And that's my religion. And then Christopher Reeve in that interview said, I think we all have a little voice inside us that will guide us. It may be God, I don't know. But I think if we shut out the noise and the clutter from our lives and we listen to that voice, it will tell us the right thing to do. Christopher Reeve showed what a real life hero is, a person who listens to the voice inside them and acts when the voice tells them the right thing to do. The end. We gather in gratitude this morning, turning our hearts to thanks and praise for the gift of living, in the presence of the spirit that animates all life, and in the knowledge that we are powerfully, profoundly connected to all that is, all that has been, and all that will be. At any time during our service, you can light a candle of joy or sorrow, a symbol of the ways our burdens are lightened and our joys are magnified, knowing they are held in common. I invite you now to offer the names of those people on your hearts, living or dead, near or far, that this community might hold them in prayer and in love. You can type them in the comments if you're joining us online. You can speak them now. Among all of these, I want to lift up Chelly Mason, who died last week. We hold her memory and her family and all those who loved her dearly in our hearts. Now we share in our litany, where we join our voices in a common refrain, and our hearts in prayer for strangers and neighbors and ourselves. The congregational refrain is, you are among us and in our hearts. All those who lean with their whole bodies toward change, you are among us and in our hearts. All those who are starting something new, who strike out in courage into the unknown places, all those who are fearful, who are not yet ready to face the next thing. All those who ache for rest and for witness. All those who are in need of nurture and tenderness, whatever the reason, known or unknown. All those whose curious minds lead them to explore, to innovate, to ask questions, to deny convention. All those who build and teach and care, those who labor for the common good. All those who are sick or isolated, All those whose spirits are filled with longing, who dream good dreams for themselves and our only world. 
Will you pray with me? May those who fear be heard and soothed in time. May the roar and rain go by. May we drown the raucous shout with laughter. And may we feel, even though we are scattered, that indeed the walls do hold love in. We ask these things for ourselves, for those we love, and for those we do not love. Amen. During these few minutes of silence, you can focus on something you're grateful for, someone you're remembering, especially today, or just the sensation of your chair supporting you. Will you find a comfortable place in your seat and take a few easy breaths as we settle into our shared silence together? We send all of these prayers, spoken and silent, up to the love that holds us all. We sing the things we cannot say. We sing our prayers and our yearnings, our hope and our heartbreak. Our meditation hymn this morning, Spirit of Life, is a humming meditation. For most of us, the congregation is invited to hum the melody and the choir will sing. You may stay seated.
One of the ways that we live out our mission to create loving community is to contribute financially to the ministries of this congregation and to the good works of our community partners. We are sharing the plate with Greensboro Mutual Aid. If you'd like to make a contribution via PayPal to the church for our offering to be split with Greensboro Mutual Aid, you can do so on our website and indicate COVID in the memo line. You can also mail a check. Ushers will come forward to collect the offering with long baskets. Our offering will now be safely, gratefully received. The choir will sing our offering hymn. Our reading this morning comes to us from the Greensboro Daily News, October 7th, 1951. Are you a Unitarian without knowing it? <laughs> Number one, do you believe the Bible to be an inspiring human document rather than the literal word of God? Number two, do you believe that man is not condemned by the doctrine of original sin, but is inherently capable of improvement? Number three, do you believe that the development of character is more important than the accepting of religious creeds? Number four, do you believe the purpose of religion is to help us live this life nobly and constructively? rather than to emphasize the preparation for an after existence? The Unitarian answers are affirmative. Join with other religious liberals who insist upon individual freedom of belief and the use of reason in religion. You are cordially invited to write Roger T. Wall. Were any of you there? No? Okay, just curious. What freedom must have captured the hearts of those who read that newspaper ad in October of 1951? Especially for those who had left the more traditional Christian congregations of their upbringing to be told there's a group of people who believe you're not inherently doomed, you're not abandoned to sin, and your only rescue is correct belief, you're not a foregone conclusion. Now to be fair, that is not a complete representation of more orthodox Christian belief, but it is a message that I know some people received, and I know that it hurt and hurt. So what freedom must have captured the hearts of those who read that ad in the Greensboro Daily News 
people who felt, finally, I am no longer alone. I do not believe the things I was taught to believe, but I ache for a community of depth and conviction. I know that I cannot live the moral life I want to entirely on my own. I know that I need the kind of guidance that comes from wrestling with ethics in groups where I feel safe, where the trust in our relationships bears us up to face hard things. What a sense of relief for those who wanted to explore the Bible together, freed from the things they were taught they were supposed to believe, freed to grapple and rage and ask questions without fear of being kicked out. What a gift to those who knew that there was something compelling in religious practice, religious community, and religious life, but didn't quite know what and couldn't quite stomach the list of things you were supposed to say you believed and were not willing to lie. I know that some of you have lived those things and felt those things. The Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd, author of After the Good News, Progressive Faith Beyond Optimism, writes about this era of Unitarian Universalism from about the middle of the 20th century onward. A few short years after that ad in the Greensboro paper, the Unitarians and the Universalists would merge and inaugurated an era of amazing optimism about liberal religion and its hope for the world in the latter half of the 20th century. Ladd describes the utopian dream, the great achievements of society that surely would be just around the corner and writes, sometimes the path to that utopian dream seemed to be paved by nothing more than the exertions of our own energy and a smattering of grace to fill in the cracks where our efforts fell short. I see echoes of that optimism in human nature in the very ad that founded this church. We are not condemned by original sin, but inherently capable of improvement. Now, to the credit of the folks who placed the ad, they did not guarantee that they personally would help you check the improvement box. (laughs) But Ladd's argument in her book that really resonates with me is there is a general self-assuredness of our own goodness about this entire era in American liberal religion that is, one, not actually in touch with the reality of human suffering and human cruelty, and two, super annoying. So this is the auction sermon, the topic for which was sufficiently broad to be somewhat daunting. Uh, Unitarian and Universalist theology, please, from one Ken Williams. (laughs) But if I am honest, the more daunting piece for me is that there is much in the last half century of Unitarian and Universalist theology that I find completely unbelievable in a way that causes despair to wash over me and for me to ask what actually is the point of all of this. So Ladd writes of the early years of her ministry right around 9-11, I also encountered an unexamined yet off-asserted optimism regarding human nature itself and a faithfulness to what we perceived as the generally upward trajectory of history. So these, the theologians call the doctrine of salvation by character. You, an individual, are capable of and responsible for your character development, and your personal cultivation of virtues is the thing that matters most in your life, and you're probably already mostly all right. And the other one, the doctrine of progress in human history. Things are just inevitably going to get better through human action, kind of, but also like we're just, things are just getting better and life is just getting easier. Perhaps you have heard that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it, how, how? This is the doctrine of progress in history. So both of these doctrines, progress in history and salvation by character, are much older than the mid-20th century. They trace their roots to 19th century modernism. So the the social, political, historical context of 19th century modernism cannot be extracted 
for, uh, away from all the sort of theologies and philosophies that come out of that time, right? So in the 19th century, um, we have the Industrial Revolution, we have rapid modernization, uh, advancements in technology, and of course, um, uh, full steam ahead on colonization and exploitation of human beings. In order, by the way, to go full steam ahead on the colonization and exploitation of human beings, what you have to do is you have to convince yourself that there are a bunch of people who don't actually count as people, right? Then you can proceed with all the colonizing. So these things can't be separated. This salvation by character is, um, was a, a set of questions suited to ask uh, what is a good kind of person? And the reader would assume you know, I. <laughs> and there were a lot of terrible policies and you know, terrible practices based in the assumption that some of us are good kinds of people and some of us are not, and therefore don't deserve stuff. Right? So you can see the problems in salvation by character. Um, so salvation by character and progress in history find expressions even today. And certainly they found their expressions in mid to late 20th century Unitarian and Universalist theology. Believing in these things, affirming the doctrine of salvation by character and the doctrine of progress in history, and behaving as if we believe these things, renders us very vulnerable to exploitation. So I'm not sure that the fossil fuel companies have undertaken a study of the great theological failures of our era. <laughs> but they act like they might have because they're really good at exploiting these weaknesses and these are just an example. Have you heard of a carbon footprint? There's yeah. a handy way for you to track all the stuff you do and you can check off how much meat you eat or how often you uh, fly on an airplane or what kind of car you drive or whatever and it'll calculate like your personal corner of the carbon output of the world. You want to know who came up with the idea of the carbon footprint? BP! <laughs> British Petroleum! Oh yes! They unveiled in the early 2000s, BP created a way for you, the consumer, to measure your individual carbon footprint, never mind who is making all the money from the carbon. You can participate in this uniquely 21st century version of salva salvation by character, which is salvation by com consumer choice. So believing that things are just going to somehow get better may temper our climate rage, which works out well for ExxonMobil, Shell, and BP. Perhaps you can tell that I have been reading the International Panel on Climate Change report that came out a couple weeks ago. Um, so today is actually not the day for all of my climate rage, though perhaps it should be, and perhaps every day should be, and also for all of you. But I just want to lift up this very important example of how these theological concepts show up in our lives and shape our participation in the public sphere. And part of what we try to do together is formulate correctives, right? So instead of um, uh, cooking up your um, ecological commitments starting from what has been sold to you by the companies who profit from the devastation of the earth, the place we start from is somewhere else, right? This is something that we can cultivate together. We can decide. Part of the purpose of religion is to help us ask those questions and to help us formulate together what are some of the ways forward. And importantly, what are some of the ways that are red herrings or false flags or siphons for energy? So here is an opportunity for some personal reflection for you. Do you find in the depths of your heart this deep belief, belief in the doctrine of salvation by character or the doctrine of salvation by com consumer choice? That what you have to do on the earth is try to be a good person. That will probably be fine, especially if you spend your money right. You can sort of take care of your corner of things and leave the rest. Does that mingle also with the doctrine of progress in history? Things in the world are just probably going to get better. And if they're not, it's like a weird short blip. But then like, they'll go back to just getting better. 
um, which lets us off the hook. These are, it should be noted, I think, the two major failures of liberal theology. And um, it is easy to point out the failures of orthodox theology, right? But we inherit a liberal tradition, and so it is for us also to turn the critical eye. Do you find that the implications of salvation by character and progress in history actually square with the deepest and truest longing in your own heart? Do they provide satisfactory answers to your middle of the night questions? I know that they don't for me. In my chaplaincy training, I learned the very important distinction between embedded theology and deliberate theology. This is like the most useful thing I learned in all of seminary, basically. Some of my deliberate theology might sound like this. I believe that every human being has worth and dignity. But under stress, especially when I have to reckon with my own shortcomings, my embedded theology might sound like this. Yeah, sure, but not me when I make any mistakes. <laughs> right? Okay, so this is the difference between the stuff that gets in there and shapes how you treat yourself, how you treat others, how you formulate your place in the world, how you understand the arc of history, and then our deliberate theology is the stuff we choose on purpose in the hope that it will help to shape our actions differently. So the beginning of Reverend Ladd's book is from Father Daniel Berrigan, a Jesuit priest and an anti-war activist. And he says, I want to suggest a strong note of reserve, of pessimism, of the ambiguous, which it seems to me are of the very nature of life today. And then to ask, in spite of it all, what are we to do with our lives? A question which seems to me a peerless source of freedom to the one who dares pose it with seriousness. It seems clear by now Anything short of confronting this question ends up sooner or later in a dead end. I met a few weeks ago with the, a few weeks ago, a few days ago, whatever, sometime. I met with the leadership of our Seniors Connecting group who are getting together to ask the question, what kind of elders do we want to be? This is the, um, the oldest and most esteemed, most long-lived group in the church facing down the questions at the end of my life in the last chapter. What kind of elder do I want to be? So for all of the rest of us, perhaps we can take a cue from our Seniors Connecting crowd. It is worth it, I think, all the time to ask, in spite of it all, what are we to do with however many days we have left? I was also talking with David Ruth earlier this week. We were talking about pandemic stuff because, you know, <laughs> it's pretty hard not to talk about it. Um, and David is in his early 60s, which I did not know, and said something like, you know, I've lived through this before. And he talked a little about the AIDS crisis, about death surrounding them, about friends and lovers dying en masse. And then he said this, and this surprised me. He said, during the AIDS crisis, there was a club in Greensboro, like a very cool club, which was a major stop between DC and Atlanta. And he said, it felt especially important during that era in that club to keep the lights going and the music blaring, to honor your friends by refusing to let your joy be stolen from you. In Berrigan's words, in spite of it all, what are we to do with our lives? in David's story and in the echoes of stories of others like him who echo that sentiment too. People say you have to keep dancing. Not because you don't know the risk, not because you're not afraid, not because that will somehow fix everything, but because breath and celebration and connection and music are some things that make life worth living. Not because everything will be okay, but because there's a really good chance it won't. He also mentioned that somebody said something 
that there was something holy about dance floors at that time, something that kind of felt like church. And I agree, you can use the language that is comfortable for you, but for my part, I know that the spirit is on the dance floor and in all the gatherings where life is lived gloriously and celebrated in the face of death, where community and power and activism and celebration blend together in the heat and the sound. This is the deliberate theology that I choose to help me face down whatever ends come and whenever they come. I reject the idea that things will just get better. I reject the idea that my primary concern is my consumer choices. And I reject, too, the feeling of powerlessness that sometimes washes over me, as if my obligations to love my neighbor are only true when it is easy, that something other than that struggle for the collective good might be asked of me, even at the end. There is much to mourn and much to fear, the optimism about human nature and the natural course of history that characterizes so much of liberal religion rings hollow. It does not at all square with reality. And yet and still, we gather to ask the questions. It is not the answers to those questions that I find meaningful in that newspaper ad from 1951. It is the project of sticking an ad in the newspaper and inviting people over to yourself, to your house, and telling them they are cordially invited to write and gathering around the pursuit of things that might matter. Building community around these questions that are at the very heart of life, asking them and seeking the answers honestly, even if it's terrifying, are the most worthy project I can possibly think of. Our greatest legacy as a faith tradition has always been to be open to wrestling with the great and powerful and painful and world-shaking questions. Our closing hymn is one of my favorites. It's, we'll build a land. And the line that always makes me cry is, we'll give them garlands instead of ashes. And I love that. But I also think I would take garlands among the ashes to start. If our primary concern is, what do you say? Do you believe that the purpose of religion is to help us live this life, this life nobly and constructively rather than to emphasize the preparation for an after existence? I love this hymn because it calls us to the vision of what could be, but we live now in the world that is. And this is a world where there are ashes, but we can give garlands too. And yet and still. We sing hymns of praise and plenty and pleading and promise. May nothing evil cross here. We'll fortify each other through the storms, come what may, not because we're assured of success or human goodness or human progress, but because there is no other choice than our blessed togetherness. So I invite you to rise in body or in spirit to sing this closing hymn. And if the waves of sorrow wash over you, let them. And if the unspeakable joy of music and being together once again wells up in your heart despite it all, for God's sake, welcome it in. Number 121.
great it is to hear that sound here in our sanctuary again, isn't it? <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> Will you join me in our chalice extinguishing words found in your order of service? We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. How good it is to be together. In spite of it all, let us go forth and bring garlands among the ashes. Amen. Chelly Mason's memorial service will be Saturday, August 21st. It's this coming Saturday in the church at 3 p.m. Masks will be required and there will be extra ones available for anyone who forgets. Um, if anyone wants coffee, you should make it, and then we'll have coffee hour. <laughs> Will you place your hands over your hearts for a benediction hymn, Shalom, Havarim, oh boy. <laughs> yep, this is a Hebrew song that means peace, dear friends, until we meet again. <laughs> <laughs>